consider supporting this podcast on Patreon. Many people may see archaeology as being inconsequential to their lives. However, a number of scholars are trying to change this conception. Today, I sit down with Hyun Soo Lee to talk about the contributions of archaeology and its importance to our lives today. Uh, Hyun Soo, thanks for joining us. Hi. Hi, it's, it's my pleasure to join. Uh, thank you for inviting me. So, um... I guess we'll just kind of start out with the basics here. Um, tell people a little bit about yourself. Um, why did you come into archaeology? Um, and then after that, you can talk a little bit about what is your research specifically? Mm-hmm. Sure. A li- little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, just a brief introduction, just uh, as, as much as you, you feel would suffice. So... So I'm, my name is Hyun Soo Lee, uh, I'm from South Korea, uh, I, I study archaeology. I came to U.S. in 2014, so I, th- from that time I, I am doing my Ph.D. program in anthropology at University of Oregon, located in Eugene. Right. Where we both went. <laughs> yeah, that's where, unfortunately, I met <laughs> this guy, Nakota. Back in Chinese class in 2015. Yeah, right, at the Chinese class 101. That's right, yeah, yeah, with Huang Lao Shu. <laughs> there was unfortunate incident and uh, we, we got along. I think we, since we both have have a really shared interest in East Asian history and culture. So we, we have talked about that a lot during like uh, sometimes studying together, uh, having fun together. So so uh, yeah, at that time, you, you remember we, we have kind of talked about we, we might have to some, some in the future, we might have to do something similar like this one. Yeah, like I know when um when we were first uh, talking about like, you know, what what could we do to make history and then archaeology by extension more accessible to people? Like you've talked about how some people have like done little cartoons, like trying to explain uh, different aspects of archaeology. You said there was a professor at UO that did that. Um, so there's definitely a community of people trying to use uh, main like new media like YouTube um, to to get more people interested in history archaeology but specifically in in Asia and um, yeah after a while like I that 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 was one of the conversations that sort of spun me in this direction of um, thinking about doing a podcast I mean there were a lot of things that got me to think about doing it but you know I remember that conversation that we had back now like you know, six years ago, roughly. Wow, that long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess tell people a little bit about what is your uh, area of research? Like, what do you do at UO? Sure. So, so in the anthropology department, uh, in, as a sub-discipline kind of, so I do archaeology and the uh, Archaeology of uh, East Asia, and more specifically, uh, northeastern China and Korean Peninsula. And for the temporal, I mostly focus on the early Holocene, uh, which can be uh, end of the Paleolithic and Neolithic Bronze Age. Can you explain for people who don't like what is like what time period is the Holocene? Like how many years ago is that? Like the Paleocene, Neolithic? Can can you kind of explain the the how far away in time that is? Sure. So. So Holocene, early Holocene is a. Uh, is a uh, is a is a chronology of the. It's based on the geological sense mostly. So. 
early Holocene will so Holocene period will be ab about it, will, it, it is understood it begins about 13, 15 thousand years ago roughly uh, and maybe it can be like 12,000 years ago so from that and we are now also living in the Holocene period so early Holocene would be so end of the early Holocene so where where is the middle Holocene late Holocene is kind of vague but in general in general in archaeology when we say early Holocene is uh, uh, 13 13 thousand years ago to uh, like uh, six six thousand years ago uh, which is which is four thousand BC something like that yeah and, and so th this is kind of a little bit of my my ignorance in the field but I, so I think that sedentary culture started happening around 13,000 years ago. So does the Holocene basically start at when agriculture and sedentary lifestyles started to appear? Is that is that where the Holocene starts? Or why, why do we start the Holocene 13,000 years ago? Also, oh, Holocene is, yeah, it's on the geological base. And that's, you know, around 12,000 years ago in globally, there was a, uh, uh, relatively abrupt environmental changes and like a geographical changes. Seawater has become so basic. Main thing is the seawater level became almost the same as today. So that's that's when the environment, global environment, got almost similar to today. So in our so like the the land bridge between like Russia and Alaska, like that the water flooded that bridge during the hol that that start of the Holocene period. Yeah. So like uh, it is assumed that like a maybe like a tw twenty thousand years ago, you know the when you look at the map with at China and Korea, in between there's a y yellow sea. And and it's understood that twenty thousand years ago that there there was not not a sea. The eastern part of the China and Korea was connected by the land. So so that's the time. So in archaeology, so it's roughly archaeologists say the beginning of the Holocene is the almost to matches with the beginning of the Neolithic period. Um, so Neolithic period. So Neolithic period, beginning of the Neolithic period can be uh, uh, maybe a little bit different uh, in Middle East, in East Asia, in America, like that. It can be like in the Middle East. It, it may be assumed that uh, Neolithic can start as early as uh, thirteen thousand years ago. But maybe in uh, maybe in the southeastern part of the Asia, it maybe can be uh, that defined. It is beginning is the like a, uh, ten thousand years ago. So there's some little. So the reason why recent archaeologists use the early Holocene rather than Neolithic is there's that differences. How how would so early Holocene is kind of a globally uh, geological term that how we define the time and 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 Neolithic Bronze Age so that's based on the this uh, Danish archaeologist Tom Thompson he he suggested this. Uh, uh, time framing idea, so Stone Age, Metal Age, you know, so that was when begin Paleolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, Early Iron Age, but that has, there was, 
been that has been used in archaeology for a long time, but right. But like you said, it's it's very in between geographic regions. Like it's not, it's not like a standard thing that that happened around the world at the same time. So you use this geographic term Holocene, right? Right. The the reason is uh, so. So Neolithic. When you say Neolithic, it is generally understood that's the beginning of the farming, beginning of the sedentary living. Sedentary living is like uh, not being nomad, moving around, but they have a certain place which they, the people stays. Or just it can be a camp, campsite. So in the very early Neolithic, uh, people kind of, people also continue to move around, but Maybe they live for 10 years here and 10 years there, something like that. <laughs> it becomes more sedentary is what you're saying. Yeah, because, yeah. but also, so, so, so there's three big things. Pot, pottery, making of the pottery from the earth. So clay, clay made pottery and the uh, beginning of the agriculture and the uh, beginning of the sedentary living. But nowadays, archaeologists are more recognizing that that three this three standard doesn't really fit into the lot of the culture. So, in some part of the world, making of the pottery appeared early, but they kept living no, in nomad nomad style, and also they didn't do. They didn't do, or they only did very limited agriculture, because that, that, that's that's really interesting. Because yeah. you know, I remember when I was in <clears throat> Dr. Lee's class, who's you know your academic advisor, she she was saying that, um, and I I don't know, maybe her opinion has changed. Like I took this class, you know, six years ago, but um, I remember she said that, you know, pottery was almost synonymous with sedentary life because what happens if you're nomadic, you know, and you do pottery? Well, the pottery would break, it would shatter, it would be too difficult to create pottery. So what she was arguing was that pottery is a, I, I don't want to say certain, because I don't know if she said that, but it's, it's a pretty good estimation that that's where sedentary culture was. But it seems like what you're saying is like that opinion is changing. Uh, I think, yeah, I think it can depend on, but I, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Pottery and sedentary is almost, uh, But you're saying there, there is maybe some rare cases where that's not true. So I, I think I, I want, I think what I wanted to say about the, so pottery and sedentary and agriculture. So agriculture can be really independent. Okay. So like, uh, yeah, you know, the archeologist Gordon Child, he suggested this Neolithic revolution idea, which Yuval, Yuval Harari recently <laughs> made his argument that, criticizing that Neolithic revolution was not a he had brought many difficulties to the human humankind actually so so but at that time when the golden child's neolithic, neolithic revolution idea was came so these three things sedentary farming pottery so that kind of was assumed that it will be universal to the all the world uh and then later, like uh, the region, like uh, I'm studying Neolithic, one of the Neolithic village in G Jilin province of the northeast China. So it's a uh, site, site name Hu Hu Ta Muga. And, and and so so specifically, what aspect of of life do you do you study um, in that in in that area? Like like do you. Uh, yeah, study like the weaponry, the material culture, or what? What do you study there? Oh, so I mostly study, I study plant plant remains, 
Yeah, I, I'm a, so we have a archaeology, we have a field, subfield called archaeo, archaeobotany. So it's archaeology plus botany. So we study plant remains that were found from the archaeological sites. So through that, uh, I study mostly uh, co beginning uh, characteristic of how people use the plant resources. So not, not just about agriculture, so plant remains can be used to, in various uh, purposes. Right, like medicine, for example. Sure, sure, sure. Medicine and making houses, make, uh, making fuel the fuel for the fire. So yeah, I study, so basically like uh, how people use plant resources uh, during the Neolithic Bronze Age time. So I was mentioning about the Hutamuga site and that site is, uh, so that site is kind of unique in a sense. It's a, so it's beginning is like a very, from the very early Holocene, like 12,000 12, years ago. So, and there was pottery found and li little, little bit of plant remains were found, uh, which were like millets. Yeah, and then, but it, from, so the so site is like a continuous occupation until uh, early Iron Age, like uh, until 300 BC. So it's like a 10,000 years of uh, occupation was at there. And then, but the, it seemed there's no like a clear agricultural tools, even during the late Bronze Age, which in other regions of Asia and Europe, that that time is like a rice agriculture is almost already like a very in a large scale. But in that region, because of the environmental situation there, it is cold, it is dry, and and they have a lot of the large lake is right near nearby. So they, that people didn't have to do agriculture actually. I, it so seems what, like... What did they eat? Uh, yeah, they mostly eat uh, freshwater fish. So they catch fish from the large lake. So it's, it's not marine fish. So see those and they catch birds like a birds yeah birds and uh, so usually the migratory bird, birds like waterfowls and some of the rabbits so mostly uh, animal remains they depend on so plant remains i found is very much smaller in amount compared to animal remains uh, so that kind of it's a good example that it, yeah. it varies across regions. So there, that at that site, uh, pottery already appeared like a uh, ten thousand years ago, and sedentary life was also began at similar time. But but agriculture was not uh, largely pr practiced. I I think they they might have grown like a b little little gardens in their home very small gardens maybe something like that so um I, I wanted to go back to this this point you had made uh earlier you were talking about how you know there's a, a sea in between you know korea and and china and you know that's you know what makes korea a peninsula um do we have a lot of information about the people that lived there that in these areas that are now completely underwater like has has there been a lot of research in those areas or not not really oh oh yeah there's uh, so there's a there's a underwater archaeology which people do scuba diving and like like searching the remains of the titanic so there's uh, that that area, uh, but 
yeah, you you would assume that that <laughs> that is really difficult to do. So it has been mostly about coaster. So say they people search for the very near near coast near ocean, uh, and mostly it, it is aimed for the sh finding the sh ship shipwreck. Uh, so it has been so like a Neolithic, Paleolithic uh, evidences that is underwater is almost it's impossible. Yeah, it, yeah. I, I as far as I know, uh, there had not been any findings underwater yeah. Neolithic before Neolithic. Yeah. Is is this a problem because? Um, we just don't have the technology to do it or is it a funding problem like you're not getting enough money to do it or or is it a mixture of both uh i think it's a mixture of both yeah so in archaeology recently a lot of fancy technology has been applied so like drone uh, 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 uh picture taking and also uh like doing the radar radar technique so it is called right radar uh, l-i-d-a-r and this technique has been used for example in Angkor Angkor Ang Angkor region of the Cambodia oh right 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 yeah, yeah. like where Angkor Wat is Angkor Wat yeah, yeah. so that er area has been uh, using this radar technique, which is so they they use some drone drone like devices and they may make uh, like radar uh, 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 like a ultraviolet uh, uh, yeah those kind of uh, images so they can uh, go beyond so they can also detect behind the uh, buildings like on yeah. underground so, right. so using that they and also they just they can it can be also simple device like a like a grass morning it looks like grass morning device so you just go to the some land with that device and it can if there's some metal things or some kind of a possible archaeological house house or uh, remains are under underground it can detect that so that ha that kind of a technique is been ro uh, widely used and and that has been uh, yeah so we it, because if if archaeology use that technology uh, we don't have to dig up and and dig up which it, which is so digging, digging is uh, basically uh, destroying, destroying the ancient remains. So we we have to destroy some of the part. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about lidar in a, in a second, especially when it comes to, um, you know, like Qin Shi Huang's tome. But um, I'll, I'll I'll get back to that in a second. Um, what? You know, so recently because of, um, you know, the pandemic and everything, you know, a lot of departments have suffered financially. Like I know um, Asian studies, not just at Oregon, but sort of across the nation, like their funding has decreased. Um, yeah. You know, history is the same thing. Um, and I assume like this is the case for anthropology, archaeology as well, right? No, right, right, right. The reason I ask is because I, I think, you know, before the pandemic, my thought was that, again, thinking to like another reading that Dr. Lee had us read, um, she was talking about the, the connection between nationalism and archaeology. And like one of the articles we read talked about how during the World War II period, you know, there was this great deal of nationalism and, and creating a national identity and sort of projecting Japanese identity back into the past. And so they funded a great deal of archaeological projects. And from what I could tell, 
you know, before the coronavirus, there was an increase in nationalism in Japan and an increase in nationalism in China. Was archaeology getting a boost before coronavirus or, or was that not really happening? Oh, so, so nationalism is, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it has been, so, so, so questioning ourselves and questioning other country, uh, like uh, how much nationalism is in, in embedded or implicitly, unconsciously, uh, yeah, nationalism is, uh, have a play in archaeological interpretation has been really huge, huge topic, huge, uh, huge uh, debate in archaeology, not, not just in East Asia, in over the world. So, uh, so I think Korea, as far as I know, China, Korea, Japan, those three countries uh, have a I, relatively, I, I'm not sure about other countries. I don't know much about other non-East Asian countries' archaeology. But I, I, as I far as I know, relatively East Asian countries, China, Japan, Korea, they, uh, in archaeology, nationalism has been pre pretty strong. And yeah, a lot of the projects has been aimed, centered to increasing uh, like a finding some important important significant findings that can be uh, valuable to e each uh, nation and ethnicities uh, not not directly in to increase some nations pri pride but there has been most I think in a lot of the cases, uh, oh, the government tends to fund more to the projects which can increase nationalism and also archaeologists also, because archaeology we need, we need uh, government support and local, local uh, corporate support to do the dig. So, yeah, there has been debate, huge debate. Uh, so, so it has been. I think it's. I'm not very sure about how how it is related with recent COVID nineteen. Uh, as far as I know, it's uh, so archaeologists. We need to go out for the excavation. So yeah, sure, there has been decrease in the excavation numbers of the excavation projects and uh, so nationalism so actually when when there's a oh sorry go ahead yeah when there's a so china korea japan they have a internal conference themselves Korean Archaeological Society, Japanese Archaeological Societies, and same in China. So, I think at there they mostly do is uh, they present the important findings in the year, like what has been found that 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 fills up the gap in the nation's history. So. It's, it's not like a directly nationalism uh, purpose, but usually uh, when, when it's discussed in, internally within the country, it's mostly, yeah, I, it, it's kind of inevitable when, when the discussion is only in the inside. So in my sense, actually, as far as I know, uh, China is the one actually when China, Japan, and Korea archaeologists are compared, I think China is the one who actually are reaching out to the Europe, Europe and uh, North America for uh, 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 
for the cooperative projects, actually. They are, so Chinese archaeology, so in, in short, I would say Chinese archaeology are much open to outsiders compared to Korea and Japan. Many historians and archaeologists, non-East Asian people who are interested in East Asia, I think they find China most attractive. I, I think so. So because they have a massive land and and government has been uh, I think the local local universities and main university has has been uh, quite quite open actually to reaching out to many uh, scholars uh, US UK Germany France France so those those countries have been have been a lot of interactions with Chinese archaeologists what, why 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 is it that there's more cooperation between other countries in China in terms of archaeology, but there's not as much cooperation in, in Korea and Japan. Is this is this a way to enable more excavations to happen? You know, the more people that you get, the more excavations that you can do. I mean, it, it's a rel relative term, so I keep using the relatively. Right, but like, like you said, in, in in relative terms, there's there's much more cooperation between the world and China than there is between. Japan. Right, relatively Tom. So right. I, I, I'm not very sure, but I think maybe in some part, some partial reason is that Chinese uh, scholar bodies has been uh, intentionally yeah, reaching out to outside to uh, you know, so basically archaeology, UK, Germany, France, US, those four countries and, and Denmark. Yeah, these countries have been like leaders. They have, they're like a technology and theory, theory and method. They are, they always go faster. So, and they introduce those technology theory and method to other parts of the world. It, it has been like that and, and I believe it is still like that I can say. So I, I think China, Chinese scholars have, have a kind of a co-op, trying to do more cooperative projects. Maybe partially because they can uh, use their uh, experience, European and American archaeologist experience and uh, technology to study China, uh, which may which may can uh, contribute to increasing uh, nation pride of the China. May maybe that that may be some reason I think, uh, but I, I wanna say careful because. Uh, I, you know, I, we, we cannot know their, we cannot know some people's uh, true intention, right? So, I think, well, I think there's some, some possibility, yeah. It, it's, w one thing that's, that's, you know, probably one of the most striking, um, you know, archaeological, I don't, I'm trying to find a way to put it. I guess one of the most striking instances of archaeology anywhere in the world, you know, maybe I would say up there with, you know, the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt is Qin Shi Huang's tome in, uh, in uh, Xi'an. And I've actually, I've actually been there. I went there and I saw the terracotta warriors and um, I didn't, I didn't go to where his, his tomb was, um, but, you know, we were close to it and, um, you know, it was just, it was, it was an amazing experience and, you know, I was in Xi'an for one week and it was, it was a great, a great time, but, um, I just wonder, 
if there's going to come a point, and I don't know if there's been any discussions about this in the archaeological community, about, hey, one day let's go excavate the tome, the tomb. You know, and I know people have had concerns about it, like, oh, maybe our preservation technology isn't good enough. We might destroy too much if we excavate the tomb. But, um, you know, I don't know how COVID is going to affect archaeology, but if after COVID, China is still willing to expand its archaeological projects, um, and if they continue to bring more people from the world in to help cooperate with them in archaeological projects. I mean, do you think there's going to be a point maybe within our lifetimes where we have the technology and the determination to excavate that tome? So, yeah, I... So, I, in my understanding, yeah, the Qin Shi Huang, the tomb, Terracotta Warriors, yeah, that because that is so. Yeah, it's one of the most well known uh, sites. And sorry, actually, I want to interrupt you just one more time, real quick. And just for, for people who don't know, um, um, uh, Qin Shi Huang, he was the first emperor of, of China, and he was the person that ordered the construction of the Terracotta Warriors, which. You know, I, I feel like most people know they're pretty famous. Um, and so he's a very important figure in Chinese history. But anyway, I just wanted to say that for people who may not have known. But his tome has not been excavated, despite the fact that we've known where it is. Um, you know, I don't, I, I might be mistaken on this, but I think we've always known where it is. It's just no one has actually excavated it. Um, Although I know the the terracotta warriors were discovered nineteen seventies, um, but in anyway, in terms of excavating his his tome, do do you think in our lifetime, we might have the technology and the determination to go in and excavate it? Oh, that's a that's a tricky question. I think there there's 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 a lot of reasons are playing there i think uh, technology and also politics yeah so i think i yeah as a technological sense i i think it, it is it is possible that uh the archaeological technology can can be rich the technological set, uh, level that can do uh, excavation, uh, but yeah, there's this politics part. So yeah, and it's it's a very national, important national treasure. So I'm very understandable. Uh, uh, tr uh, local or national government being very careful digging that. Yeah, actually, ex excavation is very, uh, how to say, like a very slow. It's very slow and uh, dormant. <laughs> it's very slow and steady and careful job. It's it's not a, like a. It's not like a, it's like it, yeah. We, we archaeologists cannot like a dig dig up like a, just digging up some earth to plant something so yeah it has to be really careful so like a uh, excavating that much important site even though uh, we we might have a technology already yeah i think there's a hesitation for that for example in in south korea uh so there is this stupa the the Buddhist uh, structure, yeah, 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 uh, which which is, which is in during the uh, like a Three Kingdoms Korea, uh, Three Kingdom period of Korea, which is uh, roughly uh, to second century A.D. to seventh century A.D. Mm, so there's this. Uh, 
yeah, one of the main uh, uh, Buddhism structure uh, stupa, and 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 it has been destroyed during the uh, during the I believe during the wars. Uh, yeah, a lot of you know Korea has recently been through a lot uh, in the 20th century. So and and and, and it's not a, like a massive stupa. But uh, restoring that stupa has been really uh, careful. So it took it took like more than I believe more than twenty years actually. So if we if Korean archaeologists want to do it quick, it could have been done in one year, I think. But we have to think think about we have to find uh, uh, Korean archaeologists and historians who are trying to find very much uh, the the utmost reliable source like uh, maybe we, we we could find like a drawings that could show how how tall was was it, it actually and what kind of material was used and what is there any uh, important monk, monks uh, the what's that yeah the you know he, he, body body remains inside the stupa and the so uh, there was not 100 percent information was not there so so like a like a lot of simulations and a lot of uh, testing and uh, just very little by little <laughs> it was restored like last year finally so yeah so archaeology is very very slow job if we want to do it really in a correct way so actually a lot of the excavation are a lot of the important uh, cultural sites are actually being uh, prematurely I, I would say prematurely studied so it's not it's not it's I think it's nobody's fault it's just the way it's a st structural issue so there's a limited funding and limited time. So, and especially in Korea and Japan, uh, like so, more than more than 90, 90 percent of the excavation is uh, rescue archaeology. So, r rescue archaeology is the archaeological dig digging happens when there's some constructions like a building a building or <sighs> road construction or like a recently in, in US there's a like building a pipeline so those those kind of mass mass construction happens in Korea and Japan there's a very str very strict law cultural heritage law that you we it has to do uh, at least a certain amount of excavation and uh, so actually, archaeology archaeologists have a very, are mostly very pressured by the cent by the federal government and local local government and the construction companies. Those three are all. Come on, you gotta finish it now, so we can construct this. And they might some of them might hope archaeologists don't find anything important, because when when it happens. <laughs> The site has to be preserved, or it has to be. It has to do go through a certain time of excavation to uh, move out important artifacts. So yeah, so that happens. So I I think that may be the import main reason why the Qin Shi Huang tomb is yeah it's not been excavated i it's not i think it's, it's more about that rather than technology yeah i guess i'll i'll i'll, I'll make this next question kind of open ended you know one one of the reasons that i that i started this podcast is because um you know like i feel like right now there's this emphasis on um, you know, um, 
people seeing like the STEM, um, you know, the, the STEM field as being, um, you know, more viable as a job option and more viable as um, sort of giving a person a future. But, you know, I wanted to show the utility and usefulness and practicality of studying things like history and Asian studies and, and archaeology. So where do you think, you know, after coronavirus, where do you think that the future of archaeology is, is going? Um, like, what is, what is archaeology contributing to uh, the world practically, and what are some of the gifts that, that archaeology is giving us? You know, and I, I just, I, you know, I'm asking this question for people out there who maybe want to study archaeology, but they think, oh, it's, it's not going to give anything useful for me, or it's, you know, this is, all, this is all just the past. Who cares about the past? Like, you know, I can't find a job doing this. Like, what would you say to those people who are interested but aren't sure if they should study this subject? Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I really wanted to talk about this question, so... Yeah. So, yeah, so archaeology is... So, it's not just about the past, so, yeah. And uh, recent uh, archaeology, archaeologists, people are trying very hard to find connection with the past and present and future. So, and, and most of the, a lot of the that comes from uh, dealing with uh, recent uh, uh, global issues, which can be climate changes and food crisis and racism and yeah, so those things are trying to so in the in the like uh, 60s, 50s archaeology in not not just uh, in East Asia and also in other part of the world has been mostly trying to it's, it has been mostly about historical archaeology actually it's it's a filling up the gap that historians cannot do through material remains uh, but recently it has been more about like a making a lot of uh, hypotheses and doing a, a environmental modeling for example uh, archaeologists cooperate with uh, geologists and chemistry or biologists to to map the continuous change in uh, world uh, worldwide temperature and how that has been interacted with the uh, so studying studying like pol pollen remains uh, through that we can track how the veg vegetation has changed with the or uh, temperature change and also sea level change and how that is related how that affected the human living and also also how human has contribute human human has uh, helped or damaged the environment and other other animals and plants so that has been a uh, lot of, lot of, it has been, is, is the main, main topic in archaeology. So archaeology is no more just dig and find the fancy thing. And so, like, we have find the earliest pottery in this region. So this kind of archaeology is too old. So what archaeology more want to do is trying to be more interdisciplinary. Uh, like a lot of uh, together job with other other area through that so it, it can sound like too too vague but yeah it, it is it is working so making making climate modeling uh, so like it has been like a ge geologist or paleo environmentalist they have been studying independently so they some study pollen remains, some study sea level changes, 
and archaeologists study just human human part. But that that's just a fragmentary all over the place. So we cannot it's hard to piece up together. We have to piece those together to figure out what happens in what happened in the past. And that can be a good clue what is happening, wh why this is happening, why there's more wildfire recently, why, why, they, why there was a massive uh, uh, sudden death of certain animal species. And it, wh are, uh, we are relying a lot to the wheat and rice, but is it okay to continue this kind of trend and how how future is gonna be like that? Is this global uh, global warming? Is is it just a nat natural cycle, or how much our human are contributing to that? So those kind of questions can be uh, discussed together. Not just only so archaeologists cannot do it by self too. So those kind of uh, discussions and so also reaching out to the indige indigenous, indigenous, indigenous people who have uh, and local, local living people who have a uh, long generational knowledge they have a traditional ecological knowledge that has been uh, taught over the over the generation and generation. So like uh, Native American people, they know how to live uh, in harmony with the environment, with the forest. So they know how to, they in, in, intentionally make, make fire, but they know how to not destroy entire things. Those kind of uh, living style and uh, those kind of uh, know-how can be studied through archaeologists, so that can also be discussed with like a forest preservation experts. So how how can we how how about changing like this way, managing our forest to to prevent for the more wildfires. So. Yeah, so archaeology has been doing, putting a lot of effort to that. And I, in my sense, uh, China, Korea, Japan needs archaeologists. Uh, yeah, they, because I think it's also a structural issue. So at those uh, three countries, because there's a, very strict uh, cultural preservation law, so it has they they must do certain things. So it's not it's not like the Chinese, Korean, Japanese people, I, I, archaeologists are not paying attention to the recent issue or something like that. It's not like they're they're doing in an old style or something like that. I, I'm pretty sure all, all regardless of the nationality uh, all the archaeologists are considering that the connecting past and present with other expert other field experts uh, but it's a structural issue because there, there are so many construction going on in Japan and Korea especially so yeah, like the, at there, they don't have enough time to do more, like a environment conservation projects, like like those those kind of uh, more projects that can be uh, more relevant to today and future. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, just just before we we finish up here, I I I ask this of every. Uh, person who I interview, um, you know, for anyone who's listening that might want to learn more about archaeology in East Asia, can you um, 
can you recommend, you know, one or two books on archaeology in East Asia for people who might want to do more reading? So there's a, there's a really, uh, I want to recommend the book which is, can be in an online version. Well, it doesn't have to be online if they want to, if they want to get it from a bookstore too, that, that's fine. Yeah, so one, one book is the handbook called Handbook of East and Southeast Asian Archaeology. So this, okay. this is a very, <laughs> really thick, thick book. Yeah. Uh, I believe maybe they have, they, maybe there is an online version too, I'm not sure, but this is a kind of a re recently published book with a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of the hardworking scholars. There's also a book named Archaeology of East Asia. The Rise of Civilization in China, Korea, and Japan. And I think I have that one, actually. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So I have that one myself. So uh, it is a good book. This was the assigned book for Dr. Lee's class. And I still have a bunch of my notes in here, too. Um, okay, so so those are some, some recommended readings, if you're interested. Um, Thank you, Hyunsu, for uh, coming on the show. And, um, you know, I, uh, you know, we touched on a lot of interesting points. And, um, you know, hopefully this gets more people interested in, uh, you know, looking more into archaeology in East Asia. Okay, so that's, uh, that's going to do it for us this week. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, make sure to... Uh, keep updated with us on the YouTube channel, the What is Asia podcast, or go to nakotadefonso.com.